music pumped through the main tent, reverberating through the tarpaulin walls. The air was heavy inside with so many people crammed into the space and the tiered seating surrounded a circle of dry dirt in the centre. Grace wondered if the town council would go mad when they found a big chunk of Dunbridge Park reduced from green grass to dusty soil. Aidy had not been forthcoming about how exactly she got the free tickets to the show. She looked a bit guilty when asked, which was weird, but nobody complained, especially since they'd been reserved seats in the front row. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringmaster, complete with top hat and red coat, materialised before the bustling audience. My name is Felix Renault, and I welcome you to the Carnival de Minuit. People rushed to take their seats. The show was about to begin. A small, dainty figure descended from the ceiling on a thick white rope. I won't bore you by flattering my own performers. I won't give you the hard sell. I'll just tell you this. The ringmaster's eyes darkened. The Minuit experience is one you will never forget. To begin, La Belle Justine. In a flash of red, he was gone, and the figure on the rope tumbled, apparently out of control. The audience gasped until she stopped abruptly, only a metre off the ground. Balancing on one foot, still wrapped in rope, the girl grinned wickedly. She was no more than 13 or 14 years old, and dressed in ballet pumps and a pink leotard with shorts. But it wasn't her outfit that made Grace stare. It was her face. For the lower half of the young girl's face was completely covered in a thick beard of soft brown hair, ending in one twirling curl beneath her chin. Some nerveless chuckling rippled through the audience as people began to notice, but the girl seemed unaffected. She tipped backwards and climbed the rope feet first, like Spider-Man, then wrapped one leg and spun around with alarming speed. Grace and the others joined in the oohs and ahs as the bearded ballerina curled herself into impossible positions, arching her back to press the soles of her feet against the back of her head, stretching into the splits with only one leg entwined by the rope. Grace hadn't seen the tight rope positioned two-thirds of the way to the ceiling until Justine somersaulted onto it. The girl then performed a beautiful tightrope ballet, pirouettes and turns, elegant arches with one foot raised in the air, all the while balanced on the thin cord suspended many metres above the tent floor. It was stunning and terrifying at the same time, and it wasn't until the girl snatched the rope and slid to the ground for a bow that Grace realised she'd been holding her breath. That was amazing, Rachel breathed. Yeah, holy cow, said Jenny. She could have fallen and broken her neck. That was awesome. Why does she have a beard? asked Aidy. Don't know, replied Grace. Maybe it's genetic. Maybe it's fake, said Jenny. It looks pretty real to me. A number of acts followed, including a strong woman with rippling muscles who threw an anvil like it was made of cardboard, a mystical sorcerer whose light display was like fireworks inside the tent, and two brothers, conjoined twins, who sang such a haunting melody that Grace swore her heart was breaking. But as the end of the show drew near, the lighting dimmed and the ringmaster reappeared. Ladies and gentlemen, he said solemnly, they make you laugh but they may also make you cry. The melancholy clowns. Grace disliked them instantly. They were unlike any troop of clowns she'd ever seen, creeping into the ring like furtive creatures and tumbling silently towards the audience. Their tattered silk suits, even when brand new, would not have been jolly. They were mostly grim shades of gray, purple and brown with some muted red and yellow stripes. Their makeup was so heavy that their eyes disappeared into their faces and their large fake grins stood out horribly. The melancholy clowns cartwheeled and somersaulted, crashing into each other in the way clowns usually do. But there was nothing fun about this performance. They didn't laugh uproariously and point at each other. And when they fell, it was like slow motion. They drifted mournfully to the ground. They rolled and jumped, but their slippered feet were completely silent. There was no music either, and Grace couldn't fathom how there wasn't a single sound from the six performers. There was an air of discomfort, and the audience seemed reluctant to break the silence. In the final sequence, three clowns tiptoed around the front row, each holding a finger to their lips, as two of their companions wheeled a huge cannon from behind the back curtain. Grace shuddered as one silent performer crept past her. Up close, his white makeup was dry and cracked, his eyes too deep, and his grin unfriendly. The cannon was aimed at the final unsuspecting clown who stood distracted, breathing in the scent of a wilting lily in his hand. The fuse was lit and the fizzing, hissing sound was all that could be heard until BANG! The awful crack of the cannon made the spectators shriek with fright. As the smoke cleared, a clown lay lifeless on the ground, his crushed lily beside him. The painted face nearest to Grace turned slowly and smiled.